Good morning, everybody. Uh, and welcome to Hackfort. Um, last time I was up here with this mic was yesterday, and I was late to my moderation meeting, and I sprinted on my bicycle, and then I ran into the building, and I almost died of a heart attack. And today I'm much better prepared, so no one has to live through the gruesomeness of me sweating my face off on the stage. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Um, my name's Greg Hahn. I've been a was a Hack For It uh, original kind of organizer. When I worked at Boise State, we helped launch Hack For It, so I've been involved for a long time, and now I'm at an organization called Searle's Place, which is an artist residency in Garden City. So we bring in artists from all over the world. They spend about a month in our home and studio that was built by uh, local artist Searle Mitchell, um, and they do, their, they do work, and they connect with the community, and they do workshops, and they do a final presentation. Uh, of course, the last couple of years have been super weird about that, right? You, does, you can't, when there were travel restrictions, you couldn't bring people in. So we had, we shifted things around. We had some local residencies. And then we got creative. And Jody uh, here is our program director. And I think this uh, current collaboration is sort of the, uh, the farthest extremes of, of, uh, of our, at least the two of us, uh, and our, our abilities to sort of think through what is the, uh, what is, what is the new way where you can think about what an artist residency is. And Kathleen Cohen, who's up here in the corner, I'm pointing at you, uh, she is our resident right now, but she's not here. She's not living in the house. She is in, still in California. Uh, we're hoping that she'll come at least for a little bit. Um, but it hasn't stopped the work she's doing and with her collaborators here. And that's what you're gonna hear about this morning. And I'm just gonna get out of the way, but uh, the work they're doing, and I'm gonna read some of it because again, this is outside of our expertise, but I'm really excited to learn along with the rest of you, but you know, uh, the first artist in resident representing immersive art, uh, and we are jointly defining what that means during her residency. Uh, it's she's she focuses on tech humanism, asking really specific questions inside virtual worlds. What makes up you, and what is real? She and her collaborators, and we have a couple of them here, are specifically focused on exploring this in Boise and Moscow with two communities that struggle to communicate the answers to these questions to our larger community, indigenous peoples in northern Idaho and neurodivergent individuals in Boise. So the question is, can creating an identity in a virtual space preserve and better clarify identity in that space and or for us as a physical community, right? See, it's complicated, uh, but I'm excited to hear some more insight about it. So the two collaborators here are John Anderson. He is a professor at the University of Idaho in virtual technology and design research. Um, oh no, he's the virtual technology and design research lab co-manager. Um, and he works with the indigenous community. And Chuck Westerberg, he's here in Boise. He's the vice president of business development and partnerships at Black, Black Box VR. I will let them all probably tell you a little bit more about themselves and just sort of kick this off. And I'm not sure who's gonna launch in. Kathleen, are you, are you going, are you in charge from afar? Uh oh, hold on one second. The sound guy's running over to make sure we can hear you. I'm good. There, there you go. You're good. Can you hear me? Can yes. You hear me? Yes. Greg, it's so nice to meet you through a box, through a box. That's right. Was I on camera? Can you see me? I'll run back over here. This was me. Uh, over here? Hi. Yeah. It's so, good. it's so good. It's so meta, the whole thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I look forward to uh, connecting in person. So being an immersive artist remotely is just right on trend, right? So uh, thank you. I don't know, I can't see everybody in the room, but um, I know I'm talking to the metaverse anyway, so it's great. So it's nice to be remoting in. A um, little bummed, of course, I'm not there on site. So thanks to Sean and your team at Hackboard, the whole AV team, everybody, I know you're trying to pull off a miracle right now. So um, I'm really happy to be here sharing a project that I'm personally working on in real time, like Greg said, nonetheless with this amazing team of collaborators that I will introduce to you. Um, the Indigenous Peoples and Neurodivergent XR Storytelling Art Project at Searle's Place a five week, six week, seven week endeavor. So it's super exciting for this to be sort of at the beginning presenting to the community. Um, can you see my slide? Yeah. I hope, I, I can't see anybody, but uh, hopefully you can see the slide. So I, I wanted to, I'm new to learning here and I wanted to acknowledge the ancestral native homelands that we're all currently residing on. 
And on the left side of the screen, I've learned that Boise sits on the Shoshone Bannock land, native land. And on the right side of the screen in Santa Monica and in Los Angeles, where I live, I live on the Kiz, Tongva, and Chumash native lands. So I know that I can, and hope we all can too, pay our respects to those indigenous peoples, their ancestors. Can you hear me? I'm um, and the beings on this land, uh, as well as those knowledge keepers of tomorrow. So I encourage everybody to go to native-land.ca native um, to learn more. So thank you. So our indigenous peoples and neurodivergent project, this could not be accomplished at all. And this is, this is really anchoring what immersive art is about. You can certainly be an immersive artist yourself, but because art and tech merge so often in all that we do, it requires a team. So this creative and visionary team, I'm so grateful to. So Jim Bradbury, who's not here today of Black Box VR, introduced me to many folks locally, including John Anderson, who's sitting on stage, University of Idaho's Virtual Technology uh, and Design Research Lab, myself of the Collaboratorium, and the artist in residence at Searle's Place, Chuck Westerberg, VP of BizDev at uh, Black Box VR, as well as Elizabeth Rogers on the team, who is a local filmmaker and screenwriter and an adjunct professor at BSU. John Waterhouse, super excited, National Geographic Explorer and Indigenous Scholar. Paul A. Wood, who's working with me here in Los Angeles now, an experienced designer, and what I love, your very own Thanksgiving table disruptor, that's a lot of fun to get into. And Julio Gonzalez, also a graduate of the Graduate Studies Program of the University of Idaho's um, Technology and Design Lab. I think there might be a little cameo from Rob Ron Oberleitner of Behavioral Imaging, and we'll hear more about that soon coming up. And of course, the entire team at Searle's Place, a terrific Boise Arts organization. So I'm not new to Hackfort. I laugh how I got started here because in 2017, I was visiting, I was going to Tree Fort. I even opted to be a volunteer to collect tickets at the reef. And I was at Story Fort that night with my friend Elizabeth, who was on the project. And we hear that the keynote speaker at Hack Fort actually had to drop out for family reasons. And so she nudged me and she said, go tell them you're here, you'll, you'll do a talk. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm volunteering, taking tickets just to get tickets to Tree Fort. She's like, tell them. Well, within like 20 minutes, we texted the woman in charge. She found me, she interviewed me on the spot and said, can you help? And I said, sure, I guess. So the irony of me coming to Hack Fort really started with you too could be a volunteer and the next day be the keynote speaker for Hack Fort. So I love this community for so many reasons, and I have been open to partnering um, with folks ever since. Super fun. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an immersive and an experienced strategist. I focus on XR. And if you follow this map counterclockwise, I was really happy being a classical painter out of art school and then a muralist and then an industrial designer focusing on glass blowing. And I thought that was gonna be my life until I got a call from a friend of mine who said, Kathleen, can you just get on the box? This was 1994. And I didn't even know what get on the box meant. And he's like, I need you on computers. We need the creatives. And I was like, there is no chance in my life I'm going to be working on computers. So fast forward. I was trained on SGI Silicon Graphics at Silicon Studios to be a VFX animator. And this right side of this whole path of my life has been 25 years. So um, I went from really glass blowing and animation within a year to being part of the first Medal of Honor PSX one team um, at DreamWorks Interactive. And who knew what we were creating back then would have a 25 year legacy forward. And of course, Pete Hirschman and that team now are doing Mo VR, which is great to see. So it's been interesting to follow this trajectory, can't even say the word trajectory, um, from virtual world building in its nascent you know, form to what and where we are today, breaking through the screen and having what I'm hoping is um, meeting the physical world with the virtual world. So somewhere in there, I spent five years working alongside Capitol Hill, telling the contemporary story of the US Constitution. I opened my own consultancy to focus on these issues around big data and how to personalize 
um, the Constitution at the time. And if you thought Hollywood was rough, try politics. After that stint, I came back to Los Angeles to work on some lofty AR VR projects. And I found myself really interested in virtual beings, digital twins, the metaverse. And where that sort of put me today is um, a, a, a sort of multitude of things. I joined the Holleride team, which the Holleride team is um, a spin out out of Audi, a German innovation team that focuses on XR and real time motion data. Super excited of what they're up to. And I work on a lot of projects that are in uh, media and entertainment that focus on location based um, entertainment in its own right. But at the end of the day, there's one thing here. There's one thing here that keeps coming up. I keep showing up as the tech humanist in the, world, in the room. I am often the one that is the ethical framework, asking the tough questions. Where's the humanism in everything that we're doing? You know, I, I ask in the future, in the next 10 years at the very least, do we want to be part of more XR walled gardens or am I more interested in the accessibility of web XR and open source? And one thing for certain is that I know AI will ultimately reflect all of our biases back to us. And that ethical framework, I keep saying, who's, who's holding that? With every living or inanimate object soon that's gonna have an AI, that's gonna be our school teacher when we go outside or we put gear on, who exactly are those people programming all of those AIs? And how is that actually being informed for us to receive that information? And I've said this in several talks, do those AI engineers sit next to behavioral psychologists, cultural anthropologists, or sociologists in order to inform any of this AI? Who has the agency and the authority? So we need to ask what it means often to be human and what um, is the value of humanity at the end of the day. So let's just say, I care a lot about humanism and going forward, not just our own social dilemma, but all of the humanist uh, factors that play in everything we build. So it's by no mistake that I'm working in a vertical that is <laughs> referred to as the death care industry, not the healthcare industry. And uh, imagine holograms at your own funeral and uh, what's the ethical conversation around that? Why should that start happening right now? Is that taboo? Is it sacrilegious? For some folks, this awareness of death will help inform our life ahead, and especially for our kids, sort of demystifying the idea of death. Um, Tom Emmerich had mentioned this in a, he had a quote last year, or maybe, actually it was like maybe five months ago, that XR will be the death of death. And, and I find that really true. So yeah, last year in Forbes, I was called out as a digital embalmer. And ever since then, I'm trying to live up to this crazy title. I mean, one title I never thought my career would ever have. So once you decide a path and you work in the death care industry, all these things show up for you, right? So I'm actually driving home from the gym a few months ago and out of my right window, I see this sign. And it's so small and insignificant that I actually drove two blocks, turned around, came back. I'm like, did I just see what I think I saw? Yeah, we buy souls. So all I could think of at the time is like, Tom Waits, what would Tom Waits? Tom Waits has that song, what's he building? What the hell is he doing in there? So I've been bantering this idea of being a digital embalmer and we buy souls in our future and what this means. I, ha I have done a lot of homework on we buy souls so we can chat later about what exactly uh, that means. But at the end of the day, where all this has brought me, where COVID, where this last year of how we've worked remote, it has brought a lot of clarity to the work I do, which is we're living in this tribrid moment. We're being asked to stitch together, not just our physical and our digital lives, but now our virtual and immersive lives. And this seamless story about who we are in the physical world, the digital world, and the immersive VR or virtual world or XR world. So this is such a signature moment for us as makers, as storytellers in technology. And, and the point is we need to hear from everybody and have a shared taxonomy that's all inclusive. So that's what's informing a lot of this joint project. So the artist in residency at Searle's Place, I'm kind of the artist in residency, not actually in residency, but am I in residency, right? This is my attempt to find ways back to Boise because 10 years ago when I first came to Boise, I thought, you know, this bumper sticker for this town should say, Boise, life is actually possible because there was like 
free parking meters. I don't even think there were parking meters. There was like access. Nobody had an access problem. You could go walk right into the Capitol building. I was like, life is so possible here. So I'm hoping everybody is familiar with Searle's Place, such a terrific arts organization in town that I've come to learn about. And months ago, I applied to be an artist in residence only to come to find out, and Greg, you know this, there had been no art, immersive artists uh, vertical for you, you all, but it's like many art organizations. It was of no surprise to me that we're in a moment, right? This is a new arm. And how could we not have immersive arts at this point when, when we've got um, Beeple's $69 million NFT digital art piece selling at Christie's? So how can we not start addressing where the immersive art world is going? And, and I'm not saying it's a, it's a uh, 2D immersive art image inside a 3D world. I'm saying this opens the door to all senses as a experience of art. So my hope is the first sort of artist in residence here is that the local art community really meets the local tech community and begins to close a gap here. Because I know the Hackfort community might not be running over to the art community anytime soon, but through this project, I hope the Hackfort community does bridge itself with Searle's Place and the art community. Because I think everybody could stand to socialize together and really understand uh, the intent. So let this be an invitation to really join over the next six weeks together and uh, evolve in this really cool art project. So what this art project is about. So this team of collaborators were bringing together two kind of unlikely fellows, even though John, you can talk to how you've been at this for a long while prior to me coming aboard and what I see from a creative lens and how we're all working together. So the indigenous peoples and the neurodivergent communities were really gonna find meaning, a meaningful through line here through this XR platform. And it's really about uncharted territories um, in some ways. And there's other themes that are rising to the top so we've created what we're calling XR stories. Nothing about us without us is a phrase that comes from the disability rights community and it has been used rightfully so in a multitude of um, initiatives. And it feels very right for this art piece to say nothing about us without us. So, we're, so, so I'm learning, but we're first diving in and first starting with what John has done being here in town in recreating Searle's place as a digital twin. So that first order of magnitude is where we're starting, which is how do we take an arts organization that's in its physical form, move it into the metaverse, and then begin to tell stories inside of Searle's place to see what evolves. So with that, I want to introduce you to one of our team members, John Anderson. John, um, I know you're, dry, you're, you're joining us live, but you're from the north. You're, dry, you're joining us live in Boise in the south. And I don't even know if it's north and south because there's still south to south there. But the esteemed John Anderson, why don't you take it away from here? And, and we haven't talked, but I can facilitate some of the slides here for you if you want to talk to it. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, yeah, I'll just tell you when to go next slides when we can. Yeah. Hi, I'm John Anderson. Um, enter the architect into the conversation. Um, about 30 years ago, I uh, went to school to become a master builder um, and an architect. Um, and I've always been in the art community. Uh, architecture is an expression of humanity. Uh, but something about 1991 hit where people started talking about something called the World Wide Web. Right, you know, people started to get emails, communications. My entire life has been in the virtual world. I've been working on computer systems essentially since I, I could remember, quite literally, from a Coleco ping pong game right at home, all the way into the Tandys, into the Commodore 64s, all into the Amigas, you know, 386. You you name it, right? It's been a huge, huge journey uh, in a very short time. Uh, so I started speciating very quickly, I go up to school, actually graduated at the uh, University of Idaho, also went to the Collegio del Romano uh, to study architecture in Rome, and I started looking at the human uh, speciation, whatever, changing. Uh, environments weren't just physical anymore, and they weren't just impacting people physically. Architecture was moving into the virtual world. And architecture, as we know, also has emotive responses, just like humans. It has a form, it has an art form, it has a communication and a story all behind, or I should say good architecture. 
So I, 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 through school, immediately started gravitating. I was fortunate to study under um, Professor Meredith Brian Sumption, who worked under Archie Graham in London in the 60s. Uh, he was part of Buckminster Fuller's group as well. And some of these words, as you guys start to understand, are also futurists in the world. Um, worked through that and didn't realize uh, how different we were starting to become. So flash forward to about 2001. Um, we were kicked out of architecture, if you will, uh, because we were these virtual guys. We don't exist there, right? And we pushed back. So we created a new program called Virtual Technology and Design, which is a different way of creating habitation for humans, if you will, and a motor response from it. Uh, next slide, Kathleen. Yep, it's just a quick little shot. So in our world, uh, it's the only world I can exist in with Mike. I'm highly creative. <laughs> Uh, architecture put too many boundaries on me, one of them called gravity, right? Gravity, that single force is what controls all of architecture, right? Materiality, right? What are we using to build that and fabricate it, right? Bricks and mortar, right? That's really limiting, right, to me. In the virtual world, all these lights and everything else, it's a photon. It's that same photon from the sun, comes from the sun, we add creativity to it and put it back into your eye, right? Everything we're dealing with is digitals, on or off, positive or negative, yes or no, right? But with that, we can literally create anything you can imagine. It comes with a huge social responsibility. This is way outside of the field of architecture. So I was very pleased with my colleagues to push us out of that field because we're now into a new domain, which is XR storytelling, cross-reality. So next slide, Kathleen. So I work at the University of Idaho. Um, I've been there for 25 years. That's kind of weird to think about. Uh, I work <laughs> in which is called the IRIC. It's a uh, innovation uh, studio um, where essentially no college exists in it. It's if you have high impact research, you're going to exist in it. Uh, we have a lab in there um, that really changes research and the way communication is being done, even at a higher uh, a higher institution like, like a university level. Uh, we do a lot of work, National Science Foundation, uh, State Board of Education, National Institute for Advanced Transportation Technology, the EPSCoR programs, which is a NSF program, Trust for Mutual Understanding, uh, that's a trust in uh, Manhattan uh, that looks at uh, a lot of our indigenous communities in particular, the Micron Foundation, you know, bring it back down here to Boise, uh, et cetera, Max Planck, National Geographic. Next slide. And essentially, you know, you can read this for yourself, but this is changing the way we do research and changing the way we communicate with each other on profound levels, right? Suddenly we can interact with the data. So the use of virtual graphics, you know, to convey these complex concepts has become a very useful tool in education as well, just in research in general. It's evident in the sciences and engineering where the graphic and animated expression of the concepts allows the practitioners the ability to visualize and interact with data to better understand the mechanics of complex and interrelated events and processes. The type of data we have to process as modern humans today is way outside the boundaries of our brains. I hate to say it any other way. The amount of information has to be processed. We are opening a relationship with artificial intelligence and XR that we need to use. If you think about calculators and technologies we already use, that's comfortable for us to already adapt those technologies, right? Because it gives us more than what we've had. Uh, for us to try and calculate some of the mathematics of today without using computer systems would take us back literally 100 years, right? So we come to this point where we have to go forward. So virtual design provides the ability to introduce users to the nonlinear dynamics of these processes and provides anomal ways to under, under, enhance and that's a good word, enhance our understanding of reality. Each of us have our own perspective, our own perception of reality. It's a very important perception, but each of us has our own unique, special perception of that reality, right? So how can we even contact and communicate with each other in the modern world if we're all seeing a different picture, right? And in today's world, it's highly polarized, right? I can't believe you don't see that. Right? In my world, that's exactly what's the correct way. And then suddenly, and through XR, you see and can walk through the shoes of somebody else for a mile or two. Right? A neurodivergent student who suddenly is, is overwhelmed by sound and light. And they're told, well, just get used to it. 
adapt, because that's the way normal people work. We only design the world for maybe at best 60% of us, right? So we're entering a world that I think is going to be more compassionate, and we can start to share these stories. So next slide. Um, I've been absolutely blessed. There's no doubt about it. Uh, created a program of future leaders who see the world this way too. There was never a discipline before for these people. So architecture, you know, back in the Renaissance, split into something called engineering. We don't even question engineering today, right? Uh, the Renaissance of Brunelleschi, if we will, and the calculation of forces and, the, and mathematics perception. Uh, we understood um, perspective again. We lost it, and then we suddenly realized you could calculate perspective, right? And art changed, everything changed because of our understanding of ourselves in, in the world. And we could start to calculate it. We could actually put numbers to it, right? Which evolves to today where those numbers are now worlds. We are in a new renaissance. And that is speciation coming out of architecture, which is the basis of society in my argument, uh, is also speciating very rapidly. Okay, next slide. Uh, this looks different. We don't live in a basement. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of biases. We all are packed with biases, et cetera. And you say computer and everyone thinks, oh, okay, they're in the basement and in the dark, right? Or the computer creates this for everyone. No, these are, it's very human. Uh, we're very active. Uh, computer studios are different today than they were a few years ago, right? If you walk in and just see a bank of computers, we're probably not very modern. There's more sketchbooks, Sharpies, you know, whiteboards, you know, and the computer is only one of the design tools that we use within it. And you can see with VR and everything, it's highly interactive. People are questioning in the far back. You can see a group of students working on a question in VR. So just talking to Chuck about, we, we created a mammoth, uh, a woolly mammoth that was discovered. And then we start to realize that through the bones and MRI scannings that there was actually an issue with the gate. So there was an injury on this thing. So we're like recreating time. Right? And so that's what my argument is. With XR storytelling in particular, we're creating the time machine for our future generations to understand what we were going through. That leads us to this um, current research. Um, the two areas in particular crosses over with the theme directly. Um, I work with John Waterhouse. He is a, a wonderful individual, a National Geographic explorer. We've traveled the world. We go to Siberia in particular, uh, working with indigenous communities, looking at Arctic ampl amplification. Uh, this is climate change research saying, huh, let's work with our communities and listen to them of what they're seeing in the environment. Not just listening to the scientific community, but the communities themselves by saying, what do you observe and how can we tell your story so the scientists and you can all come back together. Uh, next slide. And that's also split in the other side with the work that um, I've met Jim Bradbury in particular with AXRI. Uh, it's the Autism Cross Reality Institute here in Boise. Uh, we are looking at creating worlds and working in the VR space. Uh, this is uh, Nathan. I think I can speak on behalf of Nathan. Uh, Mitch, who is our director at the XRI, uh, this is his son. Uh, has autism, and he really was the start of a lot of this research. Uh, I knew Mitch actually through the University of Idaho back in our younger days. And he started talking about virtual reality and, and his experience that him and his wife have had. So Nathan um, was terrified of flying, was one of his issues. I went down to Salt Lake and did a flight simulator training and got to be in the cockpit of a pilot and role played the experience of what it was. And as Mitch says, it went from one of the worst plane flights to go down there to the best because his son suddenly could understand what was going on because of the use of VR. Uh, he also has got a very active mind. Uh, it's, uh, you know, maybe a little ADHD, you know, hyperactivity. Um, you know, and people want to give medications to calm him down to make him, quote, normal, right? Uh, you don't need to do that, right? You just need to enhance it. So this is one area that I, I, I find kind of poetic is they got him into VR1 uh, here in Boise and Eagle. And he, they started doing VR simulations. And as Nathan put it, is, um, mom, dad, um, I've had an itch in my brain that I could never scratch. And VR helps me scratch it, mm. right? And I still get chills every time I say that. Mm. Um, and that, it, it was a profound moment as soon as I heard that. It's like, okay, we've got, to, we've got to uncover. We've got to listen to that story more. We've got to figure that out. And according to his parents, um, within five days after just a VR session on a Saturday when they go to VR1, he'll be calm and relaxed for about five days. And then by the next weekend, they know it's about time to go get another VR experience 
And that's actually kind of a treatment, right? You know, and there's something going on there. So we're gonna be diving into that a little bit more too, but that's where we've gotta be listening to everybody's stories, not trying to tell them what we think is the answer. We need to listen to what the answer is, right? Uh, next slide, I think we're getting close to, yeah, so again, this is me. Um, we live in this world, right? Some of the early work, um, this is talking about microbiology. We actually in 2000, 2007 and 2008 were international uh, finalists um, for the International uh, Visies Challenge by the National Science Foundation. We created which, uh, an environment um, for Toxoplasma Gandhi, right? We're living in these worlds that humans can barely, barely even scan and see today, right? And this has changed. What, a quick divergent on this one, just to show you how XR storytelling can uh, expand our research and knowledge. My students created this world. They're working with the world's experts of what's going on in this world. And they see it differently, right? They're not seeing it chemically. They're seeing it spatially. They're asking innocent uh, questions. And I always say you have to embrace your ignorance because that's probably the purest you're ever going to be looking at something. And our students, they, they were worried about it after they create this world and they interacted and, and they had the expert there and they're like, well, we've got these questions. We're so embarrassed we don't want to ask them. I'm like, no, ask them. They asked five questions to the gentleman about what's happening in this world that resulted in $5.2 million worth of research, mm. right? Because they saw this world differently for the first time and they were asking Dr. Riza Balaga going, what is this? What's happening? And you saw him, hmm, that's a really good question. <laughs> huh, that's a really good question. I don't know, right? And we got this co-evolution of knowledge that advanced humans, right? Just through the investigation of what it's like. Uh, next slide. Which sums it up probably to this, and I'll let Chuck uh, take after this, but you know, everyone has their own unique perspective of reality, right? And so what I've been doing in my lab over the last two decades is to essentially create places where people can share and learn from those perspectives. Uh, to simplify it. Uh, XR storytelling, to try and simplify it, is every object you see has an embedded story to it, right? And has a way to communicate to it. We're used to human communication, but like I was arguing with architecture as well, Searle's place has an emotion. It has time, it has memories, it has art. It can change the society of the Treasure Valley just by existing itself. But it doesn't do that if it's just one person at a time. So Kathleen's residency, yes, is going to be is digital. But now we're not talking about one artist. We're talking about thousands. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a community now that can come in and embrace the digital twinning that is happening and hear from each other. I think that's my last slide. Thanks, Kathleen. John, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I can't wait to be in physical form too, sharing sharing all of that. Well, so, I'm going to divert real quick, Kathleen. Sorry, but um, I'm not convinced Kathleen exists. <laughs> right? Right. To me, she is a digital twin and an artificial intelligent agent. I have never seen her. I do not know it exists, right? And yet we're creating something together. I didn't know Chuck existed until yesterday. Yeah. I mean, and, this is so this is what's so great about it, right? I may never physically immediate. show up. <laughs> um, Chuck, before you take the mic, I just had to throw this slide in because a couple years ago, when you guys opened up uh, Black Box's uh, flagship experience, I think on Market Street, right? In San Francisco. Yeah. Um, I went to try it out. I think we met in person, if that's true. And I had such a great time and I, I took some great photos. And this one I love just because it's so true. The experience was great. It was like, yep, level up your life. So with that, I wanted to introduce you all to Black Box VR, which you all know, obviously, and Chuck Westerberg, you, my friend, have the floor. Well, thank you. It's going to be tough to follow up these guys. Um, they're awesome people to work with, and obviously you're doing some amazingly meaningful stuff here uh, in Boise and abroad in northern Idaho and everywhere else for that matter. But first, uh, I'd like to take just a quick second to introduce my colleague and good friend of mine, Jim Bradbury. Um, he's a black box. We've worked together now for you know about six years, um, kind of big brother uh, to me, but uh, awesome individual, and he's very active in the community. Um, and you know, as John was mentioning, uh, has lots of things that he's doing to help out the uh, you know kids with autism and um, things all across the board. He's also instrumental in, in helping uh, you know Kathleen and John and everyone else in this project. Um, so uh, he can't be here today. He, his son is. Uh, in Maine on a on a invitation to go to a, a lacrosse like pro camp. So 
Nice. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Chuck uh, at Black Box, and um, just to give you the quick two second on Black Box, we created a virtual reality fitness company that merges resistance training and video game playing, so that you uh, you know get up off the couch and get moving, um, and it's all quantifiable. Um, so we just got a UCLA study that came out that said that uh, our 30 minute workout is in the top 90 percent of all workouts so that they uh, compared it to, including like you know, uphill mountain biking and bodybuilding and, you know, just steady state cardio, et cetera, et cetera. But what I really want to kind of talk about, um, you can go to the next slide whenever you want to, Kathleen. Um, what, what we're really here for is, is obviously for, um, to talk about Searle's place and, and this new art medium. And, and just to tell you guys, th the main goal of this entire project is really to encourage the community to, to participate in Searle's place, not only, uh, you know, in the, in this early stages of this project, but as this, uh, it unfolds over the next, you know, few months and into the future. And so, um, you know, if you guys have questions or you know somebody that might be interested or that wants to go to Searle's place and participate, you know, please let them know, um, you, you know, the, the more the merrier. Um, I mean, this is going to be a really cool thing, and really, it's not going to to come to fruition and be what we all want it to be unless there's partic participation from everyone else out in the community. So, you know, really excited about that. And the other thing is, is just making sure that people understand that, you know, tech and art aren't two separate things. We're trying to bring those two and merge those two things together. Um, I, I, you know, the first time that we really started to realize you know what this could be um was a few you know about six years ago when virtual reality first started coming out and um we were invited by the boise art museum uh to come over and do a um to their gila and do a uh, immersive art experience so we found a, a, lo a local artist that does you know lots of you know amazing pieces and we brought over a full vr um uh, set up to his house and said hey you got a month go into you know the VR, uh, it was Tilt Brush at the time, I want you to create a piece of, of digital art. And a month later, he unveiled it um, at the event at the Boise Art Museum. And so, you know, there was all the patrons and the, and the boosters and, and everyone there um, put on this headset and they were, you know, taken into, uh, you know, this really cool kind of black area when he first got in there. And then when he started it up, his digital piece of art was there and it was one of those things that you're not just staring at it on the wall uh, or on a, on, a pod on a pedestal in the middle of a, you know a, an art gallery you're actually able to physically walk around it and walk into it and get underneath it if you wanted to lay on the floor and look up at it or whatever you might want to and then by the end of the night since we had the original copy we were able to uh, hand over the controllers to anybody that wanted to come in there and they could come in there and they could start marking up and doing their making their own additions to the art piece so that it went from being just this you know sole piece that this this artist created now it was a, a collaboration with the community and the patrons uh, at the art museum and I think that really helped people start to understand that hey you know VR technology isn't just sitting around and playing video games um, it's actually you know so much more than that um, and it opened the door for a lot of people and you start to see a lot more digital artists now in VR and um, that's something that's uh, been been really awesome to see unfold um, We've also been lucky enough at Black Box, we had a sister company called the Idaho Virtual Reality Council. And so in about four years, we were able to put about 35,000 people through VR experiences. And so we started, you know, we have kids and we did it at nursing homes. We put everybody that we could through this stuff just to see how they reacted. One, we wanted to have our own learnings for Black Box. And two, our greater goal is to just introduce uh, the technology to the community. And again, let people know that, you know, yes, you can play games in it, but you can use it for architecture, you can use it for art, you can use it for education and healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, over the years, we were we were able to, to, you know, help people understand, one, what virtual reality is, because most people didn't know. Uh, and if they did have an experience with it, at least up until the last, you know, year, uh, it was like a Google Cardboard and, and very lo-fi. Um, and now, you know, years later, there's a lot more people that know what it is, that engage with it on a, on a regular basis, that do meetings in it from work. Um, and really what that brings us back to is just... Um, how we're, we're, that technology is helping people tell their own story. It's helping people preserve, um, you know, their memories and their stories so that they can pass it on to, to loved ones. Kind of a, another lo-fi but very meaningful <clears throat> uh, kind of example for this is uh, there was a gal that reached out to us, I think it was five years ago, and her husband uh, had about three weeks left to live. He had cancer. He was in hospice. He was at the house, and he had some little kids, and he used to be a river guide. Um, and his one bucket list thing he wanted to do with his kids is he wanted to take them on a, 
um, a, a guided raft trip down the stretch of the river that he used to take people on over a couple, you know, it was a two day, two day uh, trip. And he was too sick to take his kids. And so Jim and I kind of collaborated, came up with an idea. And Jim used to be a river guide as well. So we sent Jim. Jim went with a 360 camera mounted on top of his helmet. And he floated that entire stretch that um, that the kid's father um, used, used to float. And then we took that video footage and we put it on a bunch of different devices. And we brought it to his house. And the dad and the kids and the wife were all able to sit down in the same room, put on a headset, and float the river and have 360, you know, felt like, you know, they were, they were there without getting wet and they got to experience that with their dad. And he, then he passed away a couple of days later. But what we did was allow those kids to have a shared experience with their father, um, him passing down memories and stories to his children that they will never forget. Uh, and it just sets a precedent. Uh, I mean, as, as Kathleen will, will tell it there with everything that she's doing since she's a, a you know, a digital embalmer. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, really, there's a lot of people in the community and her, and we've talked about this a little bit. You know, the future is going to be crazy when we start to think about how we preserve ourselves, how, uh, you know, a grandchild might be able to, you know, hear a story that their grandpa told, is telling when he's, you know, 30 years old, uh, and they can physically walk around him, get close to him, and it's almost like he's really there. And and yeah. that's, you know, it, it's it's creepy in a way, but it's amazing in, in a lot of ways, too. You know, I want to see my grandpa when he was 30. I'd love my kids, you know, to, to see me as well so you know the, the future is going to be you know crazy what our perception of real and not real is definitely going to change um, and so again I just encourage every single person here before we open this up to kind of Q&A um, again to participate in this project um, have your minds blown along with ours share stories uh, good or bad and and help us help you and everything else to, to make this project you know really really become what we all hope and want it to be over at Searle's place. So with that, Kathleen, um, I think you might have another slide or two in there if I'm forgetting something, but uh, if not, then I think we can do Q and A. Yeah, absolutely. Chuck, thanks so much. You know what I love is like the human factor of black box. You guys have always presented and shown up um, so human first. And that's why I'm so excited um, to work with you all on this. And, and John, from everything you said too, there is such synergy and we're all in sync and we have the same and shared values here. So it's really great to see how this explores, uh, how we explore this. So um, I know it's at least 1048. I don't know timing. Can someone let me know how much time we have? Because did we start late? Are we going to 1050? Where are we at? Uh, we can probably go about another five to seven minutes since we started late um, and we can comp the Zoom meeting room that we're on right now does need to be used for another session by noon. So as long as we have a heart out by noon, we should be good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just think 10 minutes here. So we were going to open it up to Q&A after the three of us, John, Chuck, and myself talked about these bullet points, but I, this is really generous for everybody. So John and Chuck, feel free to weigh in, but I was sort of thinking about, you know, why this project and uh, this sort of bridging together of unlikely fellows, it might seem from the outside, whether it's indigenous peoples and the neurodivergent community, whether it's the art and the tech community, which is not unlikely, but to some folks, everybody stays very insular down their lane. But the big, the big obvious is like what the last year and a half has been for all of us. I have never once been so grateful that in a unfortunate pandemic, and um, I lost my own mother to COVID during this this time, that in, in an unfortunate pandemic that the whole world shares this grieving, and yet the whole world now knows the word virtual. And for the first time, people have said to me, and, and while virtual is being used differently, like virtual conferencing, at least there's an entree in, and people finally have said, Kathleen, wow, we finally think we know what you do. I'm like, oh boy, you know, it's taken 25 years to get here. So, so the C word and what it did for all of us, I'm, you know, John and, and Chuck, feel free to weigh in on what it's done for you both, since this is the world we've been in forever anyway. How has it changed? That's my question to both of you. Well, I mean, at first, it gave me the opportunity to just walk out to my desk and work in my underwear right after I woke up. So that was, you know, that was great for a little bit. But then after I got through the depression stage, then I put my pants back on and we went to work like we were supposed to. But, uh, but no, I mean, I mean, that's, that's, that's the big thing. We got rid of our complete office downtown at Black Box because everybody was working at home and we were already working with, you know, uh, you know, immersive technologies and things like that. So, you know, for us, it wasn't that big of a deal. Everyone kept working, everybody mm -hmm. kept talking, everybody kept, you know, getting up, putting on their, uh, 
their VR headsets and, and joining each other with our virtual avatars and little meeting groups and whiteboarding sessions and stuff. So, you know, for us, I think it was probably l less of an adjustment than it probably was for a lot of other people who are, you know, used to uh, more formal means of communication. But I mean, how did it change for you, John? Yeah, I'm going to, it, um, it, it, it was great. I hate to say it any other way. I feel bad saying it that way. In 2008, when the bubble uh, burst in the uh, or the real estate market, you, if you remember that, it was a great time for us, right? Physical architecture, that argument I put in there had changed, it busted. We actually thrive under stress in my profession. I hate to say it any other way. 2008, huge economic crash. We have architects who can't get jobs. Buildings aren't happening. Uh, I developed $30 million of research that year, mm. right? Uh, pandemic hits. Um, we have professors now having Zoom sessions and actually can run a Zoom session for the first time ever, like has already been talked about. The world knows about virtual. It's mm. exploding. We need virtual conferences. We need to connect, right? It wasn't this question of, oh, in five years, we'll take this a little more serious. It's like, we need to do this now, right? There's people out there. There's, there's still networks out here. And you know, human nature is, is we don't want to give up what we know for that future thing that may give us more than we have now, right? And that's kind of what happened with this pandemic is we had to give it up a bit, right? And so in my world, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's elevated the conversation um, heavily within the world. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a boom time right now, actually. Yeah. So, um... The other bullet points on here we, we, we have talked about and we have covered. Um, so I do wanna see if there's any Q&A, but I, I wanna highlight an important, um, the, the dates, the last bullet point. So on behalf of the XR Stories project on October 11th, which is Indigenous Peoples Day, we will be facilitating a workshop inviting the community inside a virtual experience at Searle's Place to then introduce the community to what we will be doing in our final representation of this art piece on November 5th. So I just wanna point out that I wanna extend the Hackfort and Tech community to come over to Virtual Sur Searles Place and we'll send out you know, um, Eventbrite links for that on October 11th and then from there also on November 5th. So I'm super excited to see how those unfold and John, you were at the house already beginning a bunch of scans, which I'm excited to see. So we're in the infancy. Everybody's in this with us in real time. So I don't know if there's any Q&A. You guys can facilitate that or uh, let me know. And we, I can't see it. Who has if a question? Any question, anybody? <laughs> Anyone? Your avatars have a question? Um, Chuck? What was the platform, by the way, that you guys used for your, you know, design sessions or your sprints or your meetings that you guys uh, I mean, pivoted to? Because I'm sure it wasn't Slack only. No, lately we've just been using uh, the on the Quest too. They have was it a Workplace or whatever it is that's on there, and so we've just been yeah. utilizing that. And it's kind of funny because you know your your avatar looks a little bit like cartoony, but it still looks like you, um, and like the mouth you know, like it mimics what you're saying and the eyes close and stuff. So it's uh, it's actually really fun. And I mean, what's what's awesome about those, if you guys haven't tried it or if you guys, you know, want to try it, um, is you can bring up whiteboards, you can share your screen and you can bring in people that don't have VR headsets and just do their video calls, you know, like Zoom Zoom pictures as well. So you can still all be together in those rooms. Because what one, one thing that people do lose out on when you're not around is there's all that like serendipitous, you know, ideation that happens when you're in, in a room together with people. So mm -hmm. sometimes if you're just slacking back and forth or you're emailing back and forth, you lose out on those opportunities to come up with bright ideas or brainstorm and things. And so um, some of these platforms are really helping people to, to kind of have those same relationships and those same interactions that they used to have when they were, um, you know, back at the office place. So quick question between Workplace, Altspace, and Mozilla Hubs, is there a preference for you? Because we might solicit that for our uh, October 11th event. Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to have to get back into all three of those. I think the most I've spent has been in, been in the Oculus one. So obviously I'm, yeah. I'm favorable to, to that one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if nobody has any questions, it's 1055. I want to give uh, the team time to ramp for the next talk. And I super appreciate both of you participating, being there in physical form, making this meta tribrid experience real, whatever real is. 
And if you guys have any sort of parting thoughts or um, anything that you'd like to share, please, it's, uh, it's been great to be able to present here. Well, yeah, I, I'm never short for words, but um, it's a new definition of reality, I think, that we all have to come up with. And this idea that the virtual isn't real is not the case at all, right? It changes us emotionally um, from the music we hear. Most of our world is virtual in many ways, right? So something is real that has an impact on reality, right? And so we have to question XR storytelling in particular in the virtual world because it's defined right now as not real, right? And that term real is just a new real for humanity, and that's going to change us forward, right? There's a different reality we're walking into, and that's when we get to see the mirrored reflection of what we think that reality is, right? Reality is going to be talking back to us already, but even more so. Yeah, I'm just going to um, footnote that with two ideas. One is, how are you going to feel when you walk into a room and the room knows you before you walk in? And two, I'm going to sit down in a virtual world to dinner with you while you're eating pasta bolognese and I'm the one that can taste it. So if that begins to suss out how we begin to feel all of our senses, that's what we're aiming for. So with that, I thank you guys and thanks everybody at Hack4. Yeah, thank thanks, you guys. all very much. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kathleen. Yep. You know. Yep. Uh, so to the point of these two events, searlsplace.org, you can go on there, sign up for our newsletter, and we can hit you up with when these happen and just keep an eye on, on that. And uh, thank you all very much. Pretty amazing. Thank you.